Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Grand Rounds event today. Uh, whether you're joining us here in Rangos Auditorium um, or virtually, we want to welcome everyone to the Eugene S. Wiener Award for Excellence uh, and Annual Lecture. Uh, this, this hybrid format, just as a, um, a, a few reminders for those of us because of the hybrid format, there's not a separate uh, link for the meet and greet at the end. So those of you who are joining us virtually, just please stay on the, um, on the webinar and it will occur then. Um, also, if you have a question for our speaker, um, eventually just type it into the Q&A, that'll be open. Um, and then you can ask the webinar host, we have our, our expert uh, um, AV people here with us today, of which I'm certainly not one. Uh, they will unmute you and, and go ahead and you can ask a question. And then finally, um, if you're here uh, in person, just please raise your hand or go to a microphone over there uh, to make sure that everyone will be able to, to hear your question and dialogue. Today, we're here to celebrate the, moment, the memory of an exceptional physician and surgeon, Dr. Eugene Wiener. Dr. Wiener's career here at Children's began in 1972, and he left an indelible impact on this institution. Among his many contributions, he had a longstanding interest in the management and care for ch of children with cancer and extensive involvement in the Children's Oncology Group, the nation's largest clinical research organization devoted to pediatric cancer. Gene also received several research grants to investigate aspects of pediatric cancer treatment and published extensively on surgical oncology and also venous access, including more than 85 journal articles. Finally, Gene, the building we're sitting in, Gene also had a very key role in the, in the development, implementation, and planning of this institution. And I wanna share on a personal note, I think part of my um, connection here at Children's, uh, Dr. Wiener actually operated on my cousin uh, who had cancer in the 1970s. Uh, and my cousin's care here was exemplary. Um, they, um, our family is still indebted to Children's Hospital for the care that he received. And I, um, years later, I made that connection actually with Gene when I started here in the late 1990s as a trainee. I'd like to introduce Jeff Weiner, uh, Gene's son, to have a few marks uh, about his father. Jeff, please, thank you again for joining us uh, every year here for the Weiner Award. I'd like to welcome you up to the uh, to the podium. Good morning, everybody. So, um, yeah, if everybody knows, or maybe you don't know, I live in Florida, and originally was uh, going to leave on Wednesday, and then because of the storm. Uh, Tuesday morning when I woke up and saw that it was shifting, I ended up just throwing all my stuff in the car and getting out of there. So I left some of the uh, things that I had planned on bringing, including the uh, speech I was going to deliver today. But I just want to welcome everybody again. It's glad to I'm glad to be here in person, uh, and you know, obviously honoring my father and continuing our uh, dedication to you know memorializing his time in, uh, and and. Uh, you know, what he's brought to children's. And again, just want to thank everybody for continuing his legacy and uh, really hope everybody enjoys the presentation and congratulations to this year's recipient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Once again, I'm really appreciative of you making the journey uh, all the way up here to Pittsburgh every year from Florida uh, to honor your father's legacy and the meaning of the ward, which we're looking forward to presenting right now. A few words about our award recipient this year. So I want to thank everybody, first of all, who submitted nominations. Uh, we received over 25 nominations for the Eugene S. Wiener Award this year. And, and to my memory, I think that's a record number. We have a tremendously engaged professional staff here in general children's community that put uh, that put up people's names for this. Um, I will can't wait to go ahead and go, feel free to advance the next slide, if you would, please, to announce that Dr. Jeffrey Curland is our award winner this year. Um, he's been nominated several times, I'd like to note, uh, for this award, but this year he was unanimously selected by the committee as this year's recipient. 
a few of his notable accomplishments during his career here at Children's. Um, and, and this was a laundry list, let me tell you. We could have, we, we had to be selective in terms of what we chose to share. Uh, but most recently in May of 2022, Dr. Curlin received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pediatrics Assembly of the American Thoracic Society. He's also been recognized with the UPMC Advanced Career Physician Excellence Award as, quote, an experienced physician who has made exceptional contributions to UPMC's clinical mission, unquote. Dr. Curland also wrote a book called My Own Medicine about his own experience with leukemia and cancer treatment at the Mayo Clinic. He makes it clear how this experience informs his patient care and interactions, and it's clear to all how giving of himself it, he is to his patients. And, uh, and, and maybe the most interesting anecdote. One patient who underwent lung transplantation for pulmonary fibrosis was so enamored with Dr. Curland and also the transplant coordinator that they had Dr. Curland's name and face tattooed on their leg, which I can honestly say that's the first time I've ever said that regarding a, a, a faculty member here at Children's, at least that I know about. If any of you out there have that, have had that, you, you let us know, we wanna honor that too. Um, and I, I'll c conclude with this. Anybody who knows uh, Jeff Curlin knows he's quick with a joke, but also with a tremendous amount of warmth. Um, he knows more one-liners and more jokes than I than I will ever. He's, he's forgotten, I should say, more than I'll ever know. And he tells people not to be like him often, like, don't be like me, he'll joke around. But the reality is that any of us that have known him and been close to him here over the years uh, know that we all want to be like him. Um, that he has a fierce intellect, that he has tremendous devotion uh, to this institution and to the patients, most of all the patients and families that he cares for. And in a way, uh, with his wit and, and, uh, and, and with his perspective, he cares for all of us as well. Dr. Curland is unable to join us today, but I'd like to share the following video, video message from him. So uh, if you could please roll the video. Oh, that's actually on the There are many groups that share this with me. The measures in the past have brought my colleagues at this great hospital, many students and residents who I had the opportunity to teach and learn. And finally, my patients and their family that allowed me to direct their care and learn the most. Again, I'm humbled to be here that week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Curlin. While we wish you could be with us here today, um, I know everybody appreciates that video and uh, we'll look forward to congratulating Jeff uh, when we see him around this institution. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Jean Raphael as our lecturer uh, for today's Grand Rounds. We are honored to have Dr. Raphael speak with us about the current state of health equity interventions for underserved uh, children, with chronic conditions. Dr. Raphael is Division Chief for General Academic Pediatrics, Professor of Pediatrics, and also Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs in the Department of Pediatrics at the Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. He is a nationally recognized health services researcher with a focus on health equity and improving systems for underserved children. He's been funded by the NIH, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, Health Resources and Service Administration, and, and HRSA, or the Health Resor Resources and Service Administration. His research is complemented by policy efforts toward improving the care of vulnerable populations. He is a founding director for the Center for Child Policy and Advocacy at Texas Children's Hospital, and also incoming president-elect for the Academic Pediatric Association. He's a past appointee of the Lieutenant Governor to the Texas Health Disparities Task Force. His awards are numerous and include the Research Mentorship from the Department of Pediatrics at the Baylor College of Medicine, the Health Advocacy Award for Doctors for Change, and the Torres Service Award from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. He received his BA from Williams College, MD from Harvard Medical School, and MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health. 
He completed his pediatric training at the Boston Combined Residency in Pediatrics. He also completed the Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jean Raphael. Dr. Raphael. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting to be here today uh, for such a special occasion for the Hunu Memorial Lecture and also to uh, see Dr. Curlin awarded and that story about the tattoo I will keep forever. <laughs> so I'm just gonna bring up my slides. All right. So today what I want to talk about is the science of health equity intervention. So the way I've termed this is what work and what workforce, because in my mind, it, after all these years, how I think about it, we want to uh, sort of conceptualize what kind of work we're doing and then thinking about who can actually do it. So I have three objectives for today. One, to describe the role of health inequities in healthcare, summarize current health equity intervention approaches, and then lastly, just provide overview of what workforce currently looks like and what it should look like in order to address health equity. So inequities in healthcare, I think we've heard a lot about this. So I'll just go over this very briefly. So when we're talking about with respect to race and ethnicity, people of color tend to encounter inequities in a number of areas of healthcare. So it could be access to healthcare itself, the quality of care they receive once they're in the healthcare system, and then also the health outcomes they experience. Uh, when you look at sort of the interactions within the healthcare system, people of color are generally less satisfied with the interactions with their healthcare providers. And then when you sort of zero down into the interactions that they have, what you'll find is dominant communication style, not as much uh, positivity in terms of how people interact with these communities, not much uh, request for input, and then overall it's just less patient-centered. And so those are sort of the inequities we think along the spectrum of healthcare. So when we think about it, it can happen occur, occur along a multitude of levels. So it could be at the patient level. So when the patient gets into the healthcare system, they've already experienced uh, inequities within their communities and a larger society. So that could affect health literacy, that can affect health beliefs and other areas when they come in. It can also occur along the spectrum of the provider. So the provider may come in with certain biases or discriminatory beliefs about their patient populations. And then all of that comes together in this milieu of the clinical encounter where you may have this self-fulfilling prophecy between you know, patient and provider. So a patient have, may have certain perceptions about how they're treated when they come into clinical care. So they may be more withdrawn or standoffish towards their clinical provider. The provider may read that as confirmation of certain biases that they have against uh, specific uh, patient populations. So this group is less you know, engaged. They don't tend to speak as much. So that makes that provider withdraw more. So again, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that happens in this, in this framework of just healthcare communication. And then lastly, just the healthcare system itself in terms of sort of inherent biases in terms of how it's created, it's operationalized and just carried out in general that can sort of propagate different types of inequities. So what I always like to do is go over uh, this study from uh, over a decade ago or about a decade ago, which to me really sort of defines how complicated looking at health equity can be as well as the research itself. So in this study, they were trying to look at who tends to go to low versus high quality hospitals. And so the overall purpose were, was just to understand disparities in the use of hospitals for major surgeries. So they were looking at racial, racial differences in the proportion of patients who went to high, what were deemed high versus low quality hospitals, which we'll talk about in a second. And then they also trying to see it, it did uh, proximity to these hospitals explain the differences at all. So this was among an older group of patients. So they looked at uh, Medicare files as their data source. So in theory, all these individuals had access to healthcare via insurance. So these were those who were 65 and older going a number of surgical procedures, which you see here. And then there was a measure of hospital quality that was based on morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. And then there was also a variable of geographic proximity, just very simply how close people live to these hospitals. And then the analysis was a logistic regression. So here's what I find fascinating, or just the results from the study. So, and they very simply were looking at black versus white. So they didn't look at a large spectrum of race and ethnicity. But what they found was that blacks were more likely to have surgery at what were deemed low quality hospitals, again, defined by morbidity and mortality. They were less likely to have surgery at high quality hospitals. But here's where it got interesting. 
Blacks live closer to high quality hospitals. So take a moment to think about that a little bit. So if you have insurance, you all, everyone has Medicare and you live closer to a high quality hospital, why would you tend to go to what are deemed low quality hospitals? So a number of reasons that I've sort of surmised over the years, and I'm sure there are others as well. One is just the referral patterns of their primary care providers. So their primary care providers may actually send them to surgeons who operate at what are deemed these low quality hospitals. Uh, secondly, it could be that for patients, they don't know what are the metrics to think about quality for uh, hospitals. So they don't know which sites to look up, how to interpret different types of star systems and other kind of quality rating systems as well. So it could just be a lack of information or health literacy about even looking into those areas. It could be that they're bad experiences or what are deemed these high quality hospitals. It could be that for the patient themselves, their family, their community network. Alternatively, it could be that they have had good experiences what are deemed these low quality hospitals uh, for themselves or their families or friends. And you know, furthermore, if you sort of think about it, it could be that sometimes these, what are deemed these low quality hospitals actually have the services and personnel to support that patient and their families. So those specific services could be interpreter services. It could be having a robust social work program. It could be having food pantries. So when I think about all of this and what drives quality, it's not just what it means to us in terms of, from a healthcare standpoint, meaning morbidity and mortality. Obviously, those are critically important, but there's also this great element of patient experience that might be also in, baked into that recipe, such that what the hospital looks like, who works there, what kind of resources there, what kind of personnel there as well can also drive quality. And so what I always find from this study is it just reminds me and reaffirms that it's not as simple as you think when you think about approaching health equity research, because I thought if people lived closer to certain hospitals and had access to care, and again, it's not gonna be 100% in the way we want, even with Medicare, but you would think that those people would go to specific kinds of hospitals. So over time, there's been all this research on health equity, and there's also been some healthy skepticism on health inequities. And I think that's fair, and I think it's good in terms of moving the field forward. So some would say, first, there's this incomplete accounting for all contributing uh, variables. So we're looking at race, ethnicity, what other factors are there. And true, truth be told, when you look at factors such as socioeconomic status, that's also a driver of inequities. But I would argue back that even when you account for socioeconomic status, yes, you'll see that inequities are attenuated, but they don't completely go away. So there's something else going on. The next question people have is, well, you know, when we do all these studies, how do you compare statistical significance versus clinical importance? So you find something with a p-value less than 0 0.05, that's great. And but how do you determine whether that difference merits intervention, large scale, small scale? How do you really relate that back to clinical importance of the difference you're seeing because that impacts how you allocate resources and actually trying to make a change. The next question that comes up is where do you study inequities? And a lot of times if you study it in the healthcare system, you're already too far down. Maybe you should be studying these things much more proximally to go in people's communities, um, schools, et cetera, where they live, breathe, and work. Um, and then overall what happens is people start to say, well, you know, we don't know anything about all these contributing variables, you know, statistical significance versus clinical importance, we're, maybe we're too far in when we're looking in the healthcare system. So if there's all this lack of identifiable solutions, if you can't change uh, the demographics of your patients, what can you actually do? And that starts to lead to cynicism. So what's evolved over time is people are not just thinking just in terms of these narrow frames of race and ethnicity, but started to think more largely in terms of the social determinants of health, which I think we all know about are these life enhancing resources, it's food, it's housing, it's economic and social relationships, it's transportation where people uh, get educated. It also includes the healthcare system itself. And it's not just these assets, but it's how they're distributed across society that sort of determines how long people live and what the quality of their lives are. So there's so much rationale now for addressing the social determinants of health. So one, and there have been these studies since the early 70s 
that actually show when uh, demonstrate that when you look at health outcomes, meaning the quality of life and how long people live, healthcare itself truly just accounts for 10 to 20 percent of health outcomes. The predominance of what determines health outcomes is going to be, you know, a little bit of genetics, but largely preventive care and these social determinants of health. So it's caused this shift in terms of how we think about designing strategies and designing research to address health equity. Uh, other factors that really sort of um, sort of strengthen the rationale for addressing social determinants of health is if you look at the United States versus other countries, the United States spends much less on social services relative uh, to healthcare. And when you look at comparisons to other countries, but we tend to have worse health outcomes compared to other countries that actually spend more on social services. And so that's another reason that maybe we're not allocating our resources in the right way. And then lastly, you know, treating social determinants of health is just a whole matter of treating the whole patient uh, uh, themselves. Uh, so over time, what we have is much more in the way of federal efforts to address social determinants of health. So you know, there have been accountable health communities models and funding really looking at how can we screen better for social determinants of health, referring them, providing patient navigation, making sure that we align our interventions with our resources. And since 2016, there have been changes in Medicaid managed care regulations. So pushing more for screening and addressing social determinants of health with uh, different types of incentives. And then also promoting more flexibility in alternative payment models, that those alternative payment models focus more on the screening and addressing of social determinants of health and thinking about different types of value in those alternative payment models that reward providers for really starting to think about social determinants of health. So we're seeing it on the payer side here. And then we're also seeing it from a quality and benchmarking standpoint. So a couple of years ago, US News and World Report actually put in a health equity portion to their survey. So now you have the survey that will now this will now this winter will be in its third iteration. And it really asks hospitals about what kind of data are you uh, collecting with respect to race, ethnicity, LGBTQ, uh, social determinants of health, and all of that is to look at how it relates to quality improvement strategies that these hospitals are employing, community partnerships, also you know, examining uh, those who are underrepresented in medicine, staffing and leadership, and then training that is not only recommended but required of providers and hospital leadership. So you have these incentives now from the payer side. Now you also have it from a quality side. And we've seen with our pediatric hospitals now much more oriented around health equity because there's this large incentive now through hospital ratings. And what I want to do is step out now a little bit in terms of thinking about if we're going to start to focus on health equity and the way we are now because of all these incentives with regard to payers, quality, and just what's going on in general society. There was this uh, work that was done back in 2011 with this article on health affairs, which I love because it really conceptualizes how to think about the different trajectories of even successful interventions on inequities. So let's go through them. So scenario one is that you have this intervention that disproportionately benefits underserved groups. And so it actually reduced disparities. So what does that mean? The example that's uh, classically used is that over time in adult medicine, there are all these QI uh, strategies used to address hemodialysis or the quality of hemodialysis for patients with renal failure. And over time, what they found is that when they implemented these PDSA cycles and implemented all these strategies, they found that not only did you uh, improve outcomes for all patients, but it actually led to a disproportionate impact for those who are underserved. So it helped actually close the gap because it, these strategies work even better for those who are underserved and racial ethnic minorities. So that's sort of your ideal if you're going to put an intervention out there is that not only does it help everyone, but it narrows the gap between different populations. So that's what we're shooting for. What tends to happen largely with our interventions, it's probably scenario number two, where you have an intervention and it improves the quality, but it does it at the same rate for all groups. So that is wonderful in and of itself that everyone's care improves, but it's at the same rate. So the disparities actually remain constant. Again, this may be what happens most oftentimes in the research interventions that we come up with uh, for successful. And then there's scenario number three, which I worry about a lot is that 
you may come up with an intervention that has differential uptake or benefit. And in this case, the disparities actually widen. So let's talk about a couple examples of that. So probably maybe over a decade ago in New York State, they started a quality improvement strategy, which is called public reporting. It was for uh, surgical procedures. The idea with public reporting is that you put a provider's clinical outcomes with respect to morbidity and mortality in a public realm so everyone can see it, patients, their colleagues, et cetera. And the idea is that would, in theory, incentivize that provider, in this case, the surgeon, to improve their care um, just from that pressure of you know, just having their, their outcomes out in the public. So that is a you know, demonstrated quality improvement strategy. But what happened in this case, when they tried to use it to address health inequities, uh, the outcomes were actually um, not what they expected. It was actually that in, it worsened uh, uh, inequities. And if you think about it, if I'm someone who's now incentivized um, because of public reporting to try to prove my outcomes, what it means that I'm, it means that I may cherry pick away from certain populations that I may find, you know, medically complex, socially complex. So I start to concentrate more about more around straightforward patients, the patients who are more likely to get me the outcomes that I want. So if I do that, that means uh, the best are probably taking a certain cohort of patients and leaving the more medically and socially complex patients behind for those who may provide lesser quality. So in that scenario, it actually widened inequities, which is very concerning. So again, there may be perverse incentives that sort of propagate even more inequities in this scenario. The other way to think about scenario number three is, you know, potentially what happens sometimes is we may try to take an intervention that's worked in one particular area, lift it up untouched without adapting and putting it into another area. So what would be an example? So you may say in maybe an affluent community that to improve asthma outcomes, you use a clinical decision support tool. Um, so just with all these clinical alerts and reminders to get providers to provide the uh, asthma action plan, the right types of medication, and it works in that, in that setting. And then you lift that intervention, you put it in an underserved community. In that underserved community, clinical support um, alerts may not be what is needed, maybe more education around certain medications or asthma action plans. So you could actually be putting these resources around informatics, and that may not get you what you want. So it works in one community, and it's sort of a misused resource in another community, so that can actually widen. Uh, disparities. So again, there are these three scenarios I just want you to think about as we continue to talk. So one area, large area now that people say where we can really address uh, inequities is really say, saying technology-based interventions. And there are a number of reasons why people have gone along that route. They say, okay, so overall, it's sort of become ubiquitous. Everyone has access to personal technology. We look at our kids today, our patients today, and they're constantly on devices. And so what people see is the opportunity with these mobile health tools is to really connect patients with their healthcare providers, but also importantly to connect them with their peers for social support. And all of that may actually go towards improving health and health outcomes. And when we think about it in pediatrics, there's this great potential because again, children and adolescents have really adopted uh, you know, electronic devices in a huge way, sometimes more so than we even want. And what the data shows that it's regardless of socioeconomic status. So if you look at all these surveys, you see that 90% have access to a cell phone, 80%. And when you look at it with respect to race and ethnicity, you don't see much difference at all. And so another advantage of these technology-based interventions is that they may overcome historical barriers of in-person interventions. So if you think about some of our weight-based um, weight programs where we're trying to get children to live healthier lives, and to um, have healthy living, that a lot of times those are intensive programs for six weeks, eight weeks, one to two hours in person at a time. So now if we have these technology-based interventions, then it makes it much more patient-centered. Families could do it at their own convenience. Maybe it's web-based, maybe it's an app, and that's much better in design. And so overall, it provides these advantages, of potentially low cost, broad reach, you can customize in all these different ways. So these are all the reasons that people typically say, hey, let's really start to leverage technology to address health equity. So I wanna give you a couple of research examples. So this one I thought was, this one's from years ago, but it's really sort of an elegant, simple study. 
And so this is electronic directly observed therapies. So thinking about what's been done for TB historically from a public health standpoint uh, in terms of directly observed therapies. So what they had patients do was submit their um, hydroxia via administration in videos daily. And hydroxia is a, a disease modifying agent for sickle cell disease. And so the idea is that if patients are uploading these videos, it increases their adherence, and they get these reminders, electronic reminders, to take their medication, they get personal feedback from their care team, and all of that sort of encourages them to keep taking their medication. And so what they looked at in the study was just the feasibility of doing it, the satisfaction among patients and families and overall adherence. And what they found is that it didn't take too long, so it was pretty feasible. And in terms of adherence, one way to measure that is the medication possession ratio. And that improved after enrollment and that adherence was at 93%. And even their laboratory parameters improved. So treating these children with chronic condition with this sort of very public health, uh, his historical public health intervention, but now modernizing it to technology and then using it in sickle cell actually had some nice impact. And so that's sort of some evidence of that, you know, technology could have um, a great outcomes here. Another one here, and I'll go through with you a little bit more to start to think about some of the questions we should be thinking about. This was another study done by Lori, uh, Lori Crosby at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, coming up with a self-management app for uh, individuals with sickle cell. And so looking at young adults with sickle cell, and they started off just uh, surveying these uh, young adults just about their internet use and access. And then they did interviews, co-design sessions. And then they just did more along the lines of feasibility and, uh, usability testing. So here's what I found uh, fascinating. So just like these other prior surveys, they showed that these individuals had great access to the internet. Um, it dropped off a little bit when we talked about internet to mobile phone, but still 70% computer ownership was high, cell phone ownership was high. But then in contrast to so many prior studies of the general US population, frequent service interruption was at 52%. So the key to understand is that a lot of these large sort of pew type of polling, don't ask questions about service interruptions. So you may falsely believe that people have greater access than you do. And you know, one question people ask about is what does this question about frequent service interruption usually sort of gets at whether someone's able to consistently pay for those devices. And if they're not, then they lose some service interruption. So it's not, it's not that their service isn't working, it's that it's interrupted due to inability to pay. So just by asking this one additional question, you get so much deeper into whether people have access or not. And again, it harkens back to this bigger question of do these technology-based interventions really work if people don't have access to the extent that we think they do? And so just along the next uh, steps of what this intervention, how it was created, they also looked at barriers to self-management and they found that things such as low disease self-efficacy was important to address, anxiety about their condition in general, and just lack of peer support. And so all that helped them really bake into their app what, the th what types of elements to have. So they had more visualization of self-management prog uh, progress. So what does that mean? That means they could incorporate ways that they could see data points of, they could look at their hemoglobin, how that normalized over time, as they got better with, uh, or as they used different types of strategies. They were able to customize different things for the needs and experiences of those specifically with sickle cell. And then they were also able to foster and promote social interaction between people within the app. So using all of these different kinds of, you know, a stepwise approach, you could actually design something that was very effective for patients. So these two studies, again, within a chronic condition, just showing the potential of technology, but now, I'll challenge you to think about that a little bit. So as we're saying, technology has all this potential. There are a few questions we should ask. Is the premise that underserved populations have high rate of access to mobile technology actually accurate? And I think, you know, looking at that study by Crosby when it was about 50%, you know, had these frequent service interruptions, maybe they don't. And so maybe we shouldn't lean in in the way that we're thinking about technology. Uh, another question is, do these interventions ex exacerbate disparities due to underlying differences in health uh, literacy. So if you require a certain amount of just general literacy and then more specifically health literacy to use these different apps, online programs about weight management, uh, chronic disease management, then 
you know, there's a potential that that can actually increase um, disparities because for certain populations that don't have those, those limitations or issues, they're going to do well, and then other populations are going to do less well. And then, you know, there's also disparities or inequities that we may propagate if we only have these interventions in certain languages. So oftentimes with these apps, um, these other mobile uh, technologies, they may be only in English. And so they're not available to other people. So what does that mean for people who actually can't speak English? And then lastly, I would ask you as well, can these interventions be standalone? Because if we say, oh, we'll develop this great pediatric asthma app and it's going to address inequities, but maybe there are other parts of that intervention that should exist as well. Or if it's a weight management program, can you truly just rely on people just at their own convenience, you know, looking at different videos and doing different things on their own? Or do you need sort of it to be sort of incorporated into a larger intervention? Maybe that's the more powerful way to go. So in sum, um, around uh, uh, technology-based interventions, in terms of the state of the science, you know, studies so far have been small. They're usual single institution. A lot of them are sort of feasibility studies. So they tend to be of low or moderate quality. And then just because they look at so many different types of outcomes with respect to feasibility, with respect to health outcomes, that it often prohibits any type of really rigorous meta-analysis. And so overall, I would say at this point, there's modest evidence to support efficacy. So we should continue on that track, but still asking ourselves all these types of questions. So next, quality improvement is another area where people say, okay, this is another platform, another evidence-based set of strategies to really start to address health equity. And so the idea is that, you know, quality improvement, obviously, as we know, multidisciplinary systems focused, and you can impact all these areas, efficiency, effectiveness, just reliability of our healthcare processes and our outcomes in care. And for inequities, the question is, can QI reduce disparities by, again, as we talked about before, having this amplified effect among uh, disadvantaged groups, however you want to define them. And so one specific area I want to talk about in terms of quality improvement and health equity that people are talking about now a lot is social determinants of health. We talked about that a little bit before, but you know, let's go down another level in terms of screening and addressing social determinants of health. So, from a public health standpoint, historically, and what we were taught in med school, nursing school, all these different disciplines, that the purpose of screening in healthcare is to identify undiagnosed condition in an individual person who currently doesn't have any signs or symptoms. And the hope in that this is that this early identification leads to early treatment, management, and in turn, better outcomes. So from a public health standpoint, that's how we tend to think of screening in healthcare. Now for social determinants of health screening, it's a little different. So in this instance, uh, it's sort of, it's, we know uh, the family is well aware of the social needs that they have. So when you're screening them, they already know. And then secondly, the treatments and solutions that we come up with often lie outside the healthcare system. So historical version of screening in healthcare is patient doesn't know and the solutions are within healthcare. With social terms of health screening, it really, it's a really different take in that families and patients know, uh, but the treatments and solutions lie outside of healthcare. So that raises all these uh, ethical dilemmas when we think about it. So these are just some of the ones that I think about when it comes to screening for social determinants of health. Is one is that screening may reinforce bias or stereotypes. So if I'm a black male going into a healthcare system and I also already have these perceptions of what my care will be like, what types of biases people may have about me. And someone starts asking me about, you know, uh, you know, do I, do I have some place to live? Do I have food? All of that. Then that sort of can sort of further exacerbate those feelings of mine that I already had coming in, which are, which are negative. And so that's even worse. And so uh, moving forward along those lines, patients may perceive some of these questions as being outside the scope of medical care. So I'm here for my child's asthma, but you're asking me about food insecurity, you're asking me about education, all this other stuff. What is this? What does this have to do with my asthma? And, you know, this great term I've heard here used at my institution is this concept of patient abrasion. And that concept essentially says that over time, if we're repeatedly asking patients about um, their social determinants of health, it may be traumatizing in and of itself. So 
if you think about that child that goes to the ER with asthma, and then they're asked in the ER about uh, social determinants of health by the med student, by the resident, by the faculty member, by the nurse staff, and then they get admitted, and then it replays again with a new set of team. Um, and so by within a 24 hour period, they may have been asked about social terms of health, maybe four to five times, same questions in the same way from numerous people. So over time, again, that could be traumatizing and that's that concept of patient abrasion. So these are some of the, you know, some of the negatives, but then there's also this idea that perhaps because we're asking all these questions, patients may not say, hey, this is outside the realm of medical care. They may say, well, if my doctor is asking me about this, then they must have solutions, right? And so patients may start to have new expectations of their providers because you wouldn't ask if you didn't have a solution, correct? And, you know, so then it comes into all these issues of, you know, screening for factors for which you don't have available resources. So from an ethical standpoint, why would we do that? And then lastly, I would say is, and I think this is someplace where we don't think enough, is that in the ways that we screen and refer patients who have, you know, identified social risks is that we may actually overburden community agencies. So if we say, hey, I'm going to start screening for food insecurity, I'm sending everyone to the Pittsburgh uh, uh, food bank, then you're sending all these patients and you may actually crowd out the types of individuals and families who may be more in extreme circumstances that the food bank is there to help. And the food bank does not have a loop to get back to you to say, hey, this is inappropriate. Stop sending all these patients. We don't have resources anymore. Half the people that you're sending us actually don't qualify. And so, you know, not having those feedback mechanisms can really hurt. So again, this is not to say not to screen for and address so, uh, uh, social determinants of health in our, in our healthcare realm. It's just to be more thoughtful about it. And so, you know, here I've listed, you know, just some considerations for QI best practices when we're thinking about screening and social determinants uh, and addressing social determinants of health. So on the screening side, we have to think about, you know, do we want to do something focused or expanded? So some people would say, hey, be very focused, just ask for one or two variables, maybe uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and particularly if you can have identifiable resources in the community to which you can send patients. So that's one argument. Other people on the other side will say, well, why would you do that? You know, if you only ask those questions, you miss all these other needs that people ask. So you should be expanded. So that way you only know if you ask. So ask for everything and then, you know, you can be more helpful that way. So I think that's a decision people have to make in terms of where they lie along that spectrum. Frequency is a question for this concept of patient abrasion that I mentioned before. So making sure that we sort of strategize on, do we really need six people asking a family about social determinants in a 24 hour period or when they go out to uh, out back to outpatient after they've been admitted to be asked again. And then next is this question of need versus want help. So let me explain that. So I may have food insecurity, so that is a need, but I may not want help in it. I may already have ways in which I overcome my food insecurity, what I'd really like help with is childcare. So just in the ways we ask these questions may get it different, uh, sort of the nuances that really help us serve our patients because you may be throwing um, food insecurity resources at me, but I already, and yes, I am food insecure, but I, I already know how to get over it. Just help me with this other stuff. So asking your questions the right way. Who screens is another important question. You know, oftentimes in the research it's shown that, you know, being having these discussions with your provider may hit a little differently than, you know, it being just on a form that a medical assistant collects or some other ways. So just really thinking about what the data shows. Then just overall data collection is how do you keep it? How do you store it? All of that has a lot of questions in it. And then for addressing social determinants, really collaborating with social work, because oftentimes it falls to these individuals and in sort of carrying out their plans. And I've seen so many instances where either we as faculty, residents, fellows, med students come up with these great social determinants of health screeners and no one ever talks to the social workers. And, and sort of as our interdisciplinary partner, it's sort of, it's malpractice in a sense to not include them because they're the ones who have to execute that plan. Also important to partner with community-based organizations because again, if there's no feedback loop, we may actually be hurting them and again, crowding out the people for whom they're really trying to help those in extreme needs. 
Um, so it's great to have that, um, that feedback. Leveraging technology. So now there are all these platforms out there that help screen for and address social determinants of health. One I'll mention again, this is not endorsing it one way or another. It's just, it's just the one, the only one I know, um, findhealth.org, where you can actually look at these icons that have a home, that have food, and it allows you to go into these different types of um, social needs. And then a, a patient or family can just put in their zip code and they can find, you know, where there's a, a food bank for that particular need, where they can get help with housing. So just ways we can interact with our patients using technology. And then lastly, I've talked about feedback enough. So if we're going to say as a health equity strategy, we're going to use QI and we're going to look at specifically social terms of health, these are some of the big picture questions we should be asking ourselves about. So as we move forward with the research around health, uh, health equity, as well as the quality improvement strategies around health equity, I think there are a number of questions we have to continue to think about in terms of future state. One is just the coding of data on race and ethnicity. And I think, you know, this is a question because sometimes how it's coded may not be accurate. So really getting much more accuracy around that. And I think more broadly, just moving beyond these traditional demographic categories, because there are so many other markers of, of inequities of demographics. So thinking about the impact of intersectionality. So that may be, you know, a racial ethnic minority child who has a disability. So again, thinking within the lens of chronic disease, how to more accurately get to their needs and to address what, what needs to happen for them. Um, and then focus on structural barriers and racism. So we haven't talked about that a lot today, but that is huge when we look at the history of the United States and why we are where we are with respect um, to just healthcare and health outcomes. A lot of that is baked into just all this structural racism that has occurred over a long, long period of time. So that has to be start to be incorporated in terms of how we think about our research and our quality improvement. Collaborating across different sectors. So I think increasingly now, as I think about my work, is how to actually engage payers, for example. So payers now have these incentives from the government, from their states to screen and address social determinants of health, to uh, address health equity. So they may actually have the incentive and the resources to do it, and they need academic partners to really sort of say, what kind of screening tools should we be using? What kind of work should we be using? So I think now there are more opportunities now, whereas before as academic, uh, academic uh, individuals, we may have said, I'm applying for these grants, I'm trying to get all these resources, do this work, where could people exist that could help me do this? Sometimes now they're actually within your payers because the payers have hired the staff to do this work, but they need, again, an academic partner uh, who knows the research, knows the literature, knows the evidence-based intervention. So I think it's really starting to leverage these new partnerships, also thinking about community organizations, obviously, as well. Um, other areas I think that are important, finding ways to facilitate more community participation. So engaging all these different uh, stakeholders. And I think a lot of that is learning how to be a thoughtful partner. So if we're gonna do this type of research and bringing in the community, I think it involves a lot of introspection and humility. Oftentimes our academic institutions may have bad reputations in the community either because of how we've engaged individuals in research previously or what we've done in terms of, you know, embarking on different initiatives and research and then sort of hoarding the resources and funding gotten uh, amongst ourselves. So really having that humility as we go out to our partners, amplifying their voices in the research. So it's not just what we do, but what they want to do as well. And more broadly, from a public health standpoint, just taking this health and all policies approach. So as we do our research, we do our quality improvement, looking into the community, thinking about, okay, there's this new space that's open. How can we help um, sort of decide what happens with that space? Should it be someplace that could be where people can exercise? Is someplace that you can have some kind of small market where there's healthy food? So really starting to think about a little bit more expanding how we do our research. And then what I also jokingly say to uh, a lot of my colleagues as well is, how do we avoid engagement malpractice? So if we start to incorporate uh, communities much more in terms of how we do our research, there are all these areas where we tend to fail. I failed at them. I'm sure plenty of you have failed at them as well. And so I just kind of go through them here is one, you know, just refusing to listen. So sometimes we have these great research studies and, you know, we're applying to uh, funding agencies like PCORI, which focus on patient-centered outcomes research. 
And so we find these community partners, but we have an idea already. Right? I'm going to do this technology based intervention. And we meet with these stakeholders and we say, okay, this is what we're thinking. And they say, well, I was thinking something more on community health. And that's just not anywhere within the realm of my expertise, what I was planning to do, how I plan to stake out this large career in health equity research. So then what I may do as a researcher is I, I just don't listen. I just want that letter of support from that community member. And I say, thank you very much for your input about, you know, uh, mental health, but I still think this, for example, this decision support tool is really going to address everything, maybe even address your mental health issues as well. So we go on doing what we wanted to do in the first place, which is, again, sort of engagement malpractice. Other things we may do is we may deceive or change course. We may decide that, hey, you know, there's this other program announcement. It's completely different. So now I'm going to go in a different direction. And so maybe I don't need this community partner anymore, or I'm going to change the project and deep in fundamental ways. And so now that partner doesn't know where they fit in anymore. So we tend to do that as researchers as well. I think another area is that we, we push back. And so again, we go out, we solicit input. If that input doesn't fit with the research that we're doing or the path that we're on and how we see that, we push back and we say, oh, thank you so much for your advice, but we're still doing this other thing. And then I think lastly is that sometimes in the whole totality of this, we end up serving our own purposes. So you see here is someone walking along with this big bag of money and stepping on someone else. And honestly, that's what we do with our community partners as well sometimes, is, uh, too, is that we get funding for this grant. We have included incentives for community partners. We don't reimburse them for the time spent in community advisory boards. We don't, we don't pay them when they're working. We expect them to do all of it in a voluntary manner. So there are all these ways that we do this engagement malpractice. And so I think if we're gonna do the good work of health equity research, we really have to think about ways that we reverse course and start to really think about these partnerships in a fundamentally new way. And again, I'm not, these are all things I'm sure I've done in my time and I'm sure a lot of you have done as well. So just being more mindful of how to be different. So that is the research, that is engagement. And I think another stakeholder here is just journals as well. So we've seen over the last uh, few years, just with what's going on in general society, police brutality, uh, hate crimes against different populations that you know journals have started to step up in terms of their responsibilities and how they think about research and how they promote the right types of research and methodologies and in health equity. So journals have now started thinking about more about the makeup of their editors and editorial boards. They're changing, modifying their guidelines for reviewers as authors as well, in terms of how to look at research, how to term different things, what kind of words to use, and then also just content and methodology. So you'll, you're seeing many more supplements on health equity um, and health equity research. Here's just a commentary we did at Academic Pediatrics a few years ago, which uh, looked at racial, racial justice and what we would do as a, as a group of editors. So we looked at the composition of our editors and there wasn't great diversity. Um, and that was something that was surprising to us and something that we moved forward to change. And then we start to think about other strategies in terms of having more editors that could address health equity or promote health equity and having programs that could be career development programs for those who are underrepresented in medicine in terms of becoming future editors. So we sort of took these strategies as things as a template to move forward. There was this great editorial just over a year ago um, from uh, JAMA in terms of guide new guidelines for reporting of race and ethnicity in medical and uh, scientific journals, which was just fascinating, just things that even I, as someone who's been working in health equity for a long time just didn't even think about. So this is something um, I think if you're doing research would be would be worth looking at because the journals are starting to make these these changes. So it'd be helpful to actually look at what these guidelines uh, look like. So now more increasingly journals are really starting to look at how they could uh, sort of have impact in this whole health equity research um, dynamic. So now let's shift a little bit to workforce. So the question I ask now is, who should or can do this work? I'm going to be a little facetious here, so everyone just accept that. So I think sometimes we have these workforce assumptions when it comes to health equity research. So we say, here are the people who do it, and maybe we're good with those doing it. So it's those 
who are underrepresented in medicine, you know, this may have more, um, more value to them in terms of the communities they come from. They do this work anyway, so they're the ones, they're doing a great job, let's keep them going. And then the other assumption is that generalists are the ones who should keep doing it. You know, they do primary care, or they're the folks who see a large plethora of patients. And so this is something that's already within the realm of what they do. And so these are the two groups. So it's those who are underrepresented in medicine, people who tend to be generalists, you know, maybe those in academic general peas, those in the ER, um, those who definitely sort of live within those realms. And again, I'm being a little facetious, but I, I do think this tension exists out there. And I want you to show you why it's a little problematic. So this was a study that came out in the last few years and it just looked at the impact of topic choice in terms of the rate of NIH awards to African-American or black scientists. And what's fascinating here, just the outcomes here is that, you know, African-Americans tend to propose research topics um, that end up having lower award rates uh, with NIH. And that's, that's fascinating. So again, when they try to do that work, they're in some ways penalized just by the topic itself um, and the topic themselves. And so these topics will include things about community and population level health. And then when they did you know, rigorous analysis, they found out that you know, just topic choice alone accounts for 20% of the funding gap between white and black researchers, even after controlling for all these other um, uh, variables. So again, just that topic choice really impacts these researchers and their ability to get funded. So that's really concerning. So a lot of times in the last few years, we've been talking about this concept of the minority tax or the diversity tax, this concept of you know, the, the, the work it takes to represent otherness within academic institutions. But I would say now let's drill down to what that diversity tax looks like for you, those who are underrepresented in medicine as researchers. So it's gonna create some isolation, some conflict, lower job satisfaction. We already saw from the previous slide, less NIH funding. So they're not going to have the great scholarly productivity, again, just based on the topics they choose. Um, and so overall, it's going to be lost opportunities for career advancement and promotion, and that will lead to burnout. So that is, so I want to refute uh, this notion that those who are underrepresented should be the ones primarily doing this work. And so next, let's move to generalists. And so the concern with people saying, well, generalists can focus on health equity research. One is that, you know, increasingly we have so many children with medical complexity and that they see providers across uh, specialties. They're not just seeing generalists. And frequently their subspecialists actually function as their primary clinical providers. So again, we're talking about individuals with chronic conditions today. So think about a child with sickle cell tends to see their sickle cell provider as their primary provider. Uh, someone with cystic fibrosis may see their uh, pulmonologist as their primary provider. Maybe that the subspecialist doesn't think that way, but the families, you know, tend to function that way. And then lastly, I would say there's lots of health equity research uh, gaps um, that exist uh, across the different subspecialties. So how can we actually improve uh, these workforce issues in terms of who's actually doing health equity research? So I think one, it's just better understanding of what health equity research is um, and making sure that understanding exists for our healthcare organizations, also funding agencies. So if we, have, we have a major problem if just the topic itself tends to, when you control for so many other factors, tends to lead to a funding gap. Um, I think having more career development opportunities for those who are interested in health equity research, both those who are generalists and those who are subspecialists as well. And I think the other thing I would say is not every single faculty member who does research needs to own health equity research, but it's about developing those collaborations with those who are expert in it to really do greater work across the board. So I think those collaborations are really important. Not every single person needs to be um, uh, that expert. And then lastly, I'd say just, and you're seeing increasingly now, it's just in a meeting with, uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics last week, just talking about how specialists can be more active in health equity research. And I'm seeing more and more of individuals in critical care medicine, neonatology, all these different areas who are cardiology who want to do more health equity research. So just finding ways to get those competencies or creating those collaborations. So in conclusion, I would say that health inequities continue to persist divide, despite advances in clinical care, research, policy, 
you know, we have all these interventions that are growing now. Some are technology-based, some of them are QI-based. They have the potential to reduce inequities. Alternatively, if done the wrong way, they can actually increase inequities. So it's really important that we continue to ask ourselves those ethical questions about how we're doing the research. And that, you know, next is that the evidence base for health equity interventions is evolving and continues to grow. And then lastly, you know, we need a robust research workforce to actually get this work done. And that includes subspecialists, that includes people who are um, non-URIM all coming together to make this happen. So when I think about all of this and this idea of health equity research, what work and what workforce, I always think of my kids, you know, I have, you have the two on the left who are smiling as they're supposed to. And then you have my daughter Zora on the right hand side, who is always has this healthy skepticism of the work and how to think about it. And I think it's that healthy skepticism that leads to innovation and doing things better. So with that, I will end, stop sharing and happy to take questions. And this is always the part where I worry that no one's heard me over the last hour and I've just been talking to myself.